Good evening, everyone. I hope you will join me and tonight's panel in acknowledging the various indigenous communities which you have just read on your screen. Their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. I am Vernon Scott, Assistant Director of Special Events for the Joyce Theatre Foundation. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I identify as an African-American gay male. I have salt and pepper colored hair. I'm wearing a cream colored shirt and I'm in an off-white room with walls that are filled with art. Welcome to the next installment of the Joyce's Dancing Dialogues, a series of live moderated panel discussions. Tonight's topic, is digital dance here to stay? We are joined by four amazing panelists and an accomplished moderator who will delve into the evolution of dance for the small screen over the last 15 months. Before I turn it over to tonight's moderator, I have a few quick thank yous and reminders. First, thank you to our panelists and moderator for joining us this evening and exploring this timely topic. And a special thank you to our American Sign Language interpreter, Pam Pritzker Ridley, who will be signing throughout tonight's program. We do encourage you to utilize the live chat functions on both YouTube and Facebook to engage with one another and to post questions for our panelists. There will be a Q&A opportunity toward the latter part of the panel. We are streaming live tonight so we do ask for your understanding if there is a technical delay. So far, so good. Our team is working hard behind the scenes to keep everything running smoothly. Following tonight's program, the Joyce will be posting a recording on our YouTube page that will be available for 30 days. Thank you to the Joyce's sponsor for Dancing Dialogues, First Republic, and our trustee, Lauren Short, for their generous support of this series. First Republic's commitment to the art of dance helps the Joyce to present dancing dialogues free of charge. If you enjoy tonight's panel and would like to support the Joyce's continued programming, please visit joyce.org slash donate. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Danny G. Hello, Verna. Thank you so much for that wonderful intro. Good evening, everyone. My name is Danny G, and I identify as a black straight woman. I have a light complexion. I have sandy brown long hair, shoulder length soup to one side. I'm wearing tortoise shell eye cat eye glasses with silver jewelry and a black chiffon blouse. I am surrounded by art and prints behind me of the great legendary Josephine Baker. And so I am thrilled to be a part of tonight's conversation. Is digital dance here to stay? Since the late 19th century, dance on film has been a cinematic staple and gave rise to a few of dance history's brightest icons. Beyond Hollywood, festivals centered around dance on film have emerged around the globe, including the Dance on Camera Festival, Jumping Frames, and the International Festival of Movement on Screen, to name a few. We acknowledge this rich history of dance on film as we focus tonight's discussion on the extraordinary rise of dance works created within and for the digital landscape throughout the past 18 months. Although these works are defined by many names such as screen dance, online dance, and cine dance, for the ease of tonight's discussion, we will be using the term digital dance. Now, before I welcome our established panelists into the live stream, let's take a look at some of the exciting digital dances they've been involved in during the past year and a half. Enjoy the clips.
Bravo, everyone. My goodness, incredible work. Now let's meet our panelists. First up, Amy. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Hall Garner. Um, I'm a choreographer, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am here in the studio in St. Louis, Missouri, at the Center of Creative Arts, um, creating on Kickapoo land. Uh, I'm wearing a black turtleneck. I have black tortoiseshell glasses, and I identify as a straight black woman. Thank you for that. And next up, we have Annabelle. Hi, my name is Annabelle Lopez Ochoa. I'm a freelance choreographer calling in from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. It is uh, midnight here. Uh, I'm wearing a yellow mustard turtleneck. I uh, identify as a Latina woman. I am uh, in my bedroom and behind me is a painting by uh, uh, Argentine painter Alejandro Tevez and it's a blue elephant. <laughs> Fabulous, and thank you for joining us so late where you are. Thank you. And now, Larry. Hi, I'm Larry Keglin. I'm a choreographer and curator. I am, um, my pronouns are he, him. I'm on the land of the Montaukett people currently, and I am in a black shirt with a white backdrop, and I identify as a gay white male. Thank you, Larry. And last but absolutely not least, Michael. Hello, my name is Michael Trosevec. I am a freelance dancer and co-curator of Dance on Camera Festival, um, as well as many other things lately. Um, my pronouns are he and him and his. I identify as a gay white male. I have blonde hair, I'm wearing glasses today, a gray polo shirt with a little pink plaid collar, and I'm in a, in a white room here in New York City. with a little bit of art and a very busy set of curtains behind me. Thank you, Mike. I think you and I are the only ones actually in New York at, at this moment, but thank you for that. And so most of you know, um, I work with Summer Stage and this entire year and a half, we've done a mix of, well, most of the year we did all virtual. So I'm excited to find out your thoughts on how this year has been for yourselves. So let's, let's dig right in. And actually, Annabelle, I will start with you. I mean, you've made a tremendous amount of work during this time, more than 20 pieces, I think I read. Um, and so will this medium, for dance for you continue as in your as part of your artistic repertoire will this now be your niche uh well we have to uh, first uh explain what kind of work i did four kinds of work so i did uh films via zoom with couples that were at home so they could dance together and then they would uh, be recorded by a friend coming into their home with masks and everything. So everything was uh, done without any money. Then I've done works for, uh, you know, like 20 students of schools that everybody was separated at home trying to get them on a grid in one movie. Then I choreographed through Zoom for works that were performed on stage. And then the last thing is I staged things through Zoom. Uh, of existing pieces. And I think that the one thing that will really stay will be the stagings. When an, a piece is existing, I find it actually quite uh, an easy way to stage something without uh, using a, a plane. And, you know, with the IC, IPCC report that we just got last week, maybe it's something that we have to consider to be ecologically more uh, uh, engaged. Uh, so that's definitely something that I would uh, keep using. Uh, as a crow, for especially when I travel a lot, you know, maybe I should only pass for three days. That's definitely something that you know I could be zoomed in to watch a work before it's put on stage. I wouldn't travel anymore. As to you know, making films of people at home, well, because all the dancers that I worked with, uh, they are you know they have busy schedules and they have long days uh, in the studios. So I don't know that that would continue once the pandemic is over but let's see when that pandemic is really over. <laughs> exactly. But all of that being said, I mean, the work has been brilliant that I've seen. And so congratulations on all your efforts. But speaking of all the students, Larry, that brings me to you and the Juilliard dancers, artists, musicians, your bolero, like really raised the bar. I mean, that was early on in the pandemic. I mean, it certainly gave me inspiration as I went forward in my curating digitally. And so can you just give a little bit of how the, the effort that went behind getting all of those pieces together? Well, I'll be honest, it was a gift. It was in the very beginning of the pandemic. I want to say maybe two weeks after lockdown, Damien Woodsell called and he knew I worked with communities of uh, varying ability. And he suggested that we do one for uh, Juilliard. 
And um, he and his team were amazing. They were the backbone of the project. And he and Damien was inspired. I would say everybody in the project was inspired. So that's goal number one, to get all the collaborators involved, inspired, to have an incredible administrative team um, keeping track of everybody. I think there were 100 plus people involved. And um, so it was a lot to keep track of. But sort of the thing that that anchored it was a template that we set. We really did a storyboard as if you would for a, a, you know, a film. And so we storyboarded um, about eight minutes, every six counts. So every few seconds was a new uh, clip. And it, it was a collage. We had to generate and create certainly on Zoom, but we also tasked people with, you know, you know, I need to see you in your bathtub, you know. So we knew the shot list and everyone um, was assigned their own shot list and then we assembled it later. But it was it was really a gift because it was so hard in the beginning of the pandemic and it really gave me an opportunity to be in the community and to create and to forget about the, um, the struggle. I mean, it was amazing. And I think when I first saw it, what really hit me was the, you know the global reach of it, which was a reminder that this is a global pandemic. We're all in this. And so, I mean, it was just beautiful and very moving. And if you haven't seen it, for any of you watching, find it and, and watch it. It's, it's really spectacular. So congrats, Larry, on that. Thank and you. for you, Michael, um, how has the emergence of Zoom dances or dance created for smaller screens? How do you think it will affect big screen dance films or festivals? I mean, I, I always hope like things like this where we're, we're finding new ways of collaborating and like the creative experience is growing and getting bigger that, that dance filmmakers will start to incorporate all of these ideas into the future work they're making. So that, that's one thing. I mean, I think another is there's gonna be a massive influx of films that people are gonna be submitting to festivals. So I think even prior to the pandemic, so many dance on camera, the 92nd Street Y, festivals across the country were already making space for these sort of smaller, maybe lower budget films, like what we were producing on, on Zoom and in other ways. So uh, that's already happening. And I think we're gonna have to make more space for them, really. It's, it's just gonna have to. When we open submissions, we have submissions opening probably later this summer for Dance on Camera. My expectation in some ways is that there'll be less of those larger budget type films rolling in and more of these lesser known choreographed, lesser known filmmaker, kind of all of those experience I think is gonna be the, the growth factor that we're gonna see as we as we try to curate the next festival, which could be really fascinating. I think this it's given voice to so many people, so many filmmakers, so many choreographers that maybe didn't quite have a voice before this. Yeah. Absolutely, it's been the great equalizer in a way, don't you think? You know, I, I myself had the, the honor of contributing to a, uh, a virtual presentation with Ailey back in May of last year. And it was a comp compilation of all of us ladies who danced cry over the years. And, you know, I was scrubbing the floor right here in my living room and filmed on my iPhone. And so, and it turned out beautifully. I guess if you have a good enough editor, anything can happen really. And so, and for you, Amy, I mean, your work on stage that I've had the pleasure of presenting is so fresh and energetic and alive. And you were really able to capture that on screen. And is this some, and you've done it successfully with many companies across this time. And you've been busy. And did, is this something that you think you'll continue accepting this type of work or, and why or why not? Um, well, I, First of all, I mean, I love to create. It doesn't matter if it's in the studio or on Zoom. Most of the things that you saw were on Zoom. The clip that you saw, Viva, that was on Zoom. Um, the ballet dancer, Sarah, um, Samantha Geller, she was in Miami, and John Harnage was in New York at Paul Taylor. So I've never met them. To this day, I've never met them, physically met them. So we just know each other like this on screen. Um, but hopefully in the future, I could, I could do more of both. I would love to be have everything in the proscenium. That's the goal always, to share with the audience, to interact with the audience. But I'm using this moment and technology um, for rehearsals, uh, for coaching, to, to, to create with other people. So it's been a learning curve for me and a wonderful eye opener in terms of progressing my art forward, which it was only here in the studio before. And now it's here in the studio and on camera and it, it's, it's all around. And everybody can get to you now. You know, I could be in New York, I could be in Philadelphia, I could be in Chicago all in one day. So, I mean, it's been an amazing experience in, 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 that, in that form, yeah. 
Well, I must say, I love the, of course, the one in Philadelphia that you did because that's, of course, my hometown. And I recognize all the, all the spaces. So that one was really beautiful. But it was also very emotional because it spoke to, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and, uh, you know, the progression, progression of that. And so my next question is about, you know, tapping into the emotions of the audience. I mean, because, of course, yes, the proscenium stage and we, and we can feel it from the the audience to the stage, but when you're up close and personal on some of the dancers' faces, I feel like you can really tap into, you know, their emotions in that way. And so, you know, for you, Larry, do you think that maybe there's a, a heightened emotional connection with the dancers and the companies that could then translate into future ticket sales, future support? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I wonder the video, Look, I'm in a, a bedroom right now. How often does the audience get to come into your bedroom, right? So, I mean, there is a sense of intimacy. And I think that it, there's the opportunity to bring audiences closer to the artist, choreographer, dancer, whomever. Um, so I wonder may, how that might be used in parallel to live performances. Like maybe it's for um, pre, you know, trailers or teasers or so you know, I think how are we integrating, it's not just about performance, but how are we integrating meeting the artists? So I think that um, I'm, I'll, I'll be excited to see how, how everyone does it. But yeah, I think it's gonna be a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. What I found in this entire time that people really do like behind the scenes stories. Um, even before the pandemic, I think there were little things going around like, oh, what's in the dancer's bag? And, you know, what do they do on their daily? What do they eat? People love to hear these kinds of things. Oh, so like, you'll see my partner is going to come out of the, the bathroom any minute now. <laughs> and so that, you know, you'd never meet him necessarily. <laughs> it's backstage. Um, right. And people love seeing the backstage. And even on Instagram, I hear people like, oh my God, did you see that celebrity in their bedroom? And they have such a normal kitchen. Like, so it brings you closer, but it also demystifies, right? This is a person, you know, an artist, and it, it the stage can sometimes be intimidating. Absolutely, but this is this is an off-topic subject uh, question. But do you think do you think there could be any harm to always seeing what's behind the camera? I mean, be, you know, artists want to be a little larger than life sometimes and, and a little mystical. Do we lose some of that if we share too much, do you think? Does anybody want to take a stab at that? I was, that was, I was waving at you to like, <laughs> you just you stole it right out of my head. I mean, I'm one of those people that when, when I go see performances, I want that the mystique. I want that sort of not knowing this person. I want to just see them as a body moving in space and maybe not know everything about their laundry, like those little those little details. And it, as it, it goes back and forth, there are times I really appreciate getting to know somebody maybe a little more personally, but am I really getting to know that person personally through these images they're putting on Instagram, the sort of little behind the scenes? Am I really knowing that person? I, I want to see, I want to see them perform. I'm a little old school like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, I for sure am too. Go ahead, Larry. I'm sorry. No, no, I get that. I get that too. I, I sometimes will see people on Instagram. I'm like, oh, too much information. I, I hope I didn't want to see that. I, um, but I'm wondering if before you met the artist, like, you know, is there a way to draw people in? I mean, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I had 6,000, 600,000 hits, you know, on, on YouTube. I've never had that audience, you know, so there's got to be a benefit here. There's a benefit in reaching audiences that we have not, you know, and, or, or audiences that can't or would not come. Well, it'll definitely be interesting, you know, how we straddle that line going forward. And so that leads me perfectly to the next question, which I'll start with you, Annabelle. If this type of dance fades out in favor of in-person performances, what do you think the impact will be on audiences or accessibility, especially as you know, there will probably be some people, a lot of people potentially, that might still be a little fearful to go back into theaters, even as some theaters are going all vaccinated as, as well, but there still might be some fear. So what do you think yeah. about that? I think that companies are going to involve a more cinematographic recording of archival recordings so that they can share maybe not all of their programs because, you know, it costs a lot of money to have the music online for that many days. 
uh, but I'm sure that they, they will include those people who cannot come to the theater or don't want to come, are too afraid to come. But it's true, you know, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, archival recording where people are like that big, the dancers, you can't really see them. And, uh, you know, with ABT Studio Company, we had some dancers from the New York City Ballet actually that came to record really, uh, you know, with a gimbal. And it was beautiful to see uh, this dance between the 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 cameraman and the dancers and to you know together they made a new piece of art which can be shared uh online for these people who don't want to come and see you know the black box absolutely and amy what do you to you what do you feel about this and so losing potential accessibility and keeping it going in this virtual space i think we should definitely keep it going um i love to see both you know, I'm 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 a mother, and I sometimes I can't get out to go to the theater, and so I could still see the season that happens, even though I'm not in the theater. So I love it, and I love how now, you know, in terms of my own work, how do I archive it differently? You know, editing it in a certain in a certain way, more cinematically that I I wasn't even thinking of. I mean, before I was just thinking about just hold the step, just so I can take it to the next company. But now it's like really putting that putting that, my movie director head on top of it. And that's been really interesting and fun, but I love the duality of having both uh, proscenium and the virtual stage. You know, I mean, it's nothing like it. You could just click and you're there and you could watch it on your schedule. You don't have to be in the theater at eight o'clock. You know, you could watch it at 2 a.m. if you can't sleep, you know, and the house is quiet. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed that. And I think that that has gotten me through this pandemic, just having something like that, just to calm my nerves and, and to be entertained at, at, at this moment in time where we're just kind of, our schedules are erratic and everything's not as, um, not as controlled as before. So I'm, I've, I've enjoyed it. I hope other people enjoy it too. And it gives more work too. Absolutely. You, could have, you could have both. You could have your, your, in, your onstage season and your virtual season. So yay for work. I'm all about that. <laughs> Larry, you wanted to add? I, I was just, I wonder, and maybe Amy or anybody, I wonder about the duration of work on digital space versus live space, mm -hmm. where our attention span is. I know my attention span at, at, online is like, I like a minute clip, you know? And yeah, so I'm just wondering if anyone else wanted to chime in about how that's gonna play out. No, I, I, I love a four minute clip. That's, that's all I have time for is a four, four minutes. You have me on my phone, I'm on my phone. Um, four minutes. That's it. That's all you yeah. can get. Yeah. You know. What I can quick add TV. is, yeah, time is so different on screen than it is uh, in uh, in a theater. And I, I personally, I miss the audience. I miss what I don't miss like performing, but I miss watching together and the attention and the focus of the audience create the artwork in front of our eyes. And I miss that sometimes, you know, when I'm home watching uh, work. So what I do, I'm on my phone on WhatsApp with my best friend, Dominican Republic. She watches on her, her laptop and I watch on my laptop because I feel that we watch it together. But if I'm on my own, then my focus is very short. Now, that's definitely something we learned throughout summer stage, you know, the analytics of how many people are actually watching and for how long, and then if they go back, but it, it seems to be about two to four minutes is the range. So any, any burgeoning filmmakers out there, video, <laughs> listen to these, these uh, timings, because that's very crucial to keeping an audience's um, attention. And so, but moving forward, we were just talking about this hybrid model. So for you, Michael, are you planning, even with your festival and, and everything that you're doing, a hybrid model to what you're doing? Uh, for like the dance festival I'm doing in Asbury Park, not a hybrid model, but I, I think with dance on camera, I think there is interest and we are having conversations around how can we continue to have that as a facet of what we present as a festival that, you know, there is the, the, big screen presentation, but how can we supplement and add to or sort of increase, one, increase, broaden our audience. We've got a lot more people in 2020 and 2021, people viewing from all around the world that typically wouldn't get to see. So, so that's super appealing. I'm sure everybody has had a similar experience. Mm -hmm. um, but just, just being able to, we were also able to monetize that that on screen, that virtual element. So seeing that as a possibility, a real um, 
an access point for us to expand our reach and to even put things that maybe we typically couldn't program on the big screen, whether it be archival films that maybe the quality is a little bit lower than, and it wouldn't look so good on a big screen, but it looks great on a small screen. So maybe there can be a, a virtual archive festival in tandem with the new films that are presented. So I do think for us, it's gonna keep going back and forth. But as far as like live performance and dance, I'm all about going back. But again, having that component of virtual that's still there, that there's just a, it's, yeah. Again, old school a little bit. I love being in the theater. I love not having the distractions, having a singular focus on something like that, not being able to fast forward. No, I think we're definitely- It's so the, tempting. Yeah, I think we're <laughs> on the same page with that, you know, the live, I mean, even, myself going back into our festival with Summer Stage, it was emotional. It just, I couldn't even watch the perform performance because I was so busy watching the audience and to see the joy in the faces and just being there and being amongst you know your peers and just having a great time en masse together. But to your point about you know uh, monetizing, that was one of the questions that came up as we you know navigate towards you know beyond the digital screens. How can we keep our new virtual audiences? You know maybe panels behind the scenes interviews, rehearsals, because, you know, putting putting the whole thing out there, do you feel like, you know, maybe that's giving too much away? And so how do we, can it be an actual stream, viable income stream going forward with the virtual, or do we keep it, say, free just to engage people? Michael, I'll put that to you first. Oh, I mean, I hope, I hope so. I think, I mean, the Joyce is a clear example, doing things like this that are in tandem to their paid programming, they're offering all these free programs to reach out, but but their voice, their their joy stream throughout the pandemic, that was monetized and I tuned in as often as possible. So I, I do think it's, it's possible to monetize. It's just a matter of striking that balance between how much are people willing to pay for something on a screen as opposed to how much are they willing to pay for something live. I think I'm definitely willing to pay less on a screen most often, unless it's something really unique and special. And then I think I'd be yeah. willing to just dole it out. <laughs> yeah, Annabelle, what do you say? Well, uh, I have an example. I watched The Secret uh, Christmas or The Secret Nutcracker by the Scottish Ballet. It was only three days online for free. And it was a performance really made cinematographic, completely, you know, uh, music and everything. It was amazing. And only it was for free, but at the end you could give a donation, and I was so um, moved by the the the, the amount of uh, creativity and hard work to give us that that I gave like a you know a hundred pounds because I was you know so I think that way of you know offering and then telling people you know give us what you have okay. and we'll be happy with anything. Uh, I don't know for me it worked really much better than you know getting like that fee to pay first and then maybe be entertained or not. It work better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the more, the, the, the hybrid of letting the audiences know the dancers and the companies personally, maybe there'll be that sympathetic give, like these dancers are really working hard to do what they do. These companies, you know, taking ballet in the kitchen and all, you know, this is what we've all, and maybe still sharing some of that to see what we've had to get through to get back to where we are. And so for you, Larry, what do you think might be the effect on for touring companies, uh, for people going into their seasons when so much is available online? So I'm just gonna echo what I kind of said earlier about building audiences and community engagement. You know, I know that one of the touring models for companies is certainly the, the performances, but sometimes you used to go out a week or two weeks early and do satellite teaching and, you know, divide and conquer and, build community. So, I mean, wow, we have this incredible tool now to build community before we even get on the road, you know, so that maybe the road is the, the performance is the highlight, right? And, um, you know, we can teach uh, online. So I, I'm curious to see what that looks like. Absolutely. The lead up to the performances, I think, is also a, a great tool. It's promotion, it's marketing. And the follow-up. And, and the, the follow-up. Follow space that we're in, for, for you, Michael, I'll ask, um, do you think audiences, in your estimation, were more open to emerging choreographers producing and experimenting in this space rather than choreographers with a long history who are making works probably just to maybe keep their brand, you know, sparkling or just experimenting? Hmm, tough one. I, I think it's the word rather that, that throws me off. I hope it's like also like in addition to that, mm -hmm. like I said, I think I said earlier that these emerging choreographers have opportunity now. There's a chance that they might get their work seen 
And maybe it'll force some of those people that have been around to reinvent themselves in new ways or find new possibilities, maybe stretch their stretch their imagination and also to anticipate maybe what the next new thing might be that they're all, you know, that the people that have been around are kind of pushing, 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 or maybe being pushed by those younger unknowns that are kind of driving, driving the train a little bit. I think so. I, mean, I think so. I've seen some incredible work by what I call, you know, the, the young lions out there who, who may be a little bit more in tune with some of the, the technical things that are at their fingertips that, you know, a small tour of the generations, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, you know, in tune with, but God bless them. You know, I mean, I, our interns at Summer is learning from them every day. Like, what's this new, like StreamYard, like all these things that we're using now, but you know, why not learn these things and like, keep learning as we, as we grow and to be, you know, go along with the game, you know? So, but again, to, again, the audience, if, some of us have been in front of the camera. And so for you again, Michael, because your brilliant performance, State of Darkness, but listen, come on, it was brilliant, right? So tell us what that experience was like for you, you know, performing just for a camera. And have you done work like that before? Um, not, not specifically that way to dance for a live stream, but I mean, I'll be totally honest with you. I liked it better than having an audience. <laughs> and maybe it's just because of where I am in my career and sort of like the years of, and maybe it was that solo in particular that it took such an intense level of focus to, to stay together for 35 minutes or whatever it is that you don't have that distraction of an audience. Sometimes it can be distracting. And not only the audience themselves, but that sort of surge of adrenaline that you get when there is a live audience that can sometimes push you in the wrong directions or maybe you overdo it a little too soon and in a, in a solo where you're trying to build slowly 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 it was actually easier to modulate energy and and um, but of course I miss the audience and then to return to it in June and have people there it changed us a little and it actually was better I did miss the audience so in my head I thought I'd be better off without them but 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 also, I mean, you have the brilliant Nell Shelby, who has become, you know, the the filmmaker du jour. I mean, she's I mean, she's already been brilliant, but really, Nell Shelby. Hats off to to her and her brilliant team. And so we're we're um, now talking about this increase in experimentation, and you know, for sure, a lot of it was created out of necessity. But I do feel like there was some honest interest in the medium itself as an expression, an extended expression of all of our artistic voices. And perhaps, you know, we never had the time to to really go there. And then we did. And so like even for myself at Summer Stage, it gave me a chance to, you know, flex some different creative muscles. And I, I welcome that opportunity in the midst of all the, the, the pain and sadness. But so I want to fast forward to silver linings because I just I just always, you know, we, we're dealing in such a dark time and we're coming out of it little by little, but the silver linings. So my question is, has the pandemic allowed you to work with certain dancers for the first time, collaborate with individuals for the first time who you've whom you've ever you know wanted to work with with forever? So I'll ask Larry first. All right, I'm gonna be quick so that we can pass the baton, but I never thought I was gonna work with Patty Lapone. You know, <laughs> and things were moving so fast. Damien said, we got Patty Lapone on the line in 30 minutes. Can you get on Zoom? And I'm like, okay. You know, I dropped everything. And I'm like, yep, let's do that, right? So the accessibility of people is is amazing. Pass. Amazing. Michael, what about you? There it is. I couldn't find my mute button. Uh, many silver linings. I mean, the fact I got to work with someone like Matthew Neenan, who I'd wanted to work with for a long time, and that came together because of this, and we were able to work over Zoom, and, and to collaborate with fellow Paul Taylor Dance uh, Company member Kristen Drocker and create a film that really honored Betty DeYoung in a way that like made me really happy to connect in that way, with and using so many other dancers that I like, obsess about and, and, and admire to reach to be able to reach out to them and ask them to include themselves. A, a rare dream come true. Most people are always too busy and all of a sudden they weren't. They were home like craving things to do and craving connecting. So it was a really great, that's a huge silver lining just being able to connect with people like that. Absolutely. And for you, Amy. I mean, the silver lining has been just working with new people. I mean, I've worked with four new companies, five new companies, Miami City Ballet, Dance Theater of Harlem, Ballet X, Paul Taylor. Um, it's been wonderful just to getting to know those new dancers, getting to know the new directors, um, creating things with editors 
that's a whole big thing now that I'm, I'm the editor is my, my right hand person. <laughs> you know, I mean, just that language that that whole the whole silver lining of this moment in this pandemic for me has been just creation and just having the blessing of creation. I, I can't I can't explain how um, how fortunate I am and how much it has helped me during this time. I love all of that, and I, I totally concur. And for you, Annabelle? Uh, for me, I think uh, working with Xander Parrish from the Marinsky uh, company in Russia was uh, quite amazing to a uh, so beautiful dancer and on camera even more beautiful. Uh, and also as a Latina woman, my dream is to you know work with all the companies in South America. And thanks to Zoom, uh, I got to work now with uh, Santiago El Municipal de Santiago in Chile, which probably if there was no pandemic, it would be too expensive for them to, to get me there. So it really uh, opened doors and possibilities. Can I, can I add one thing? That was Absolutely, also, Larry. Also beautiful, but um, mm -hmm. I also was just thinking that um, one of the silver linings is that we realize that dancers, choreographers are artists, right? They can create, they, they're filmmakers they're editors, they're tremendous collaborators, right? And so what an expansion of uh, our identity, you know, and that's been beautiful to see. Well, one of the silver linings for me has been uh, just this this right here. I've never done so much hosting in my entire life. And it's really giving me a brand new platform and just um, a way of putting myself out there. And, and it's been fun developing the side of myself um, during these challenging times. And so I just I'm so thankful for for the joys for this and obviously for my organization for keeping, you know, keeping us going during during, during these times. And uh, and to your point, Amy, as well, you know, working with people that I you know, haven't had a chance to meet yet in person, but hopefully I will soon. And this has all just been um, inspiring, really. It's been really inspiring. And also to see the, the collaborations across you know, countries and continents is, I think for me, really been moving. And so I think we have some time now for some Q&A. Are you guys ready? Well, the hot seat. <laughs> so our first question looks like it's from Monique Martin, fellow collaborator of mine in the past and a good friend. Question is, has there been real investment partnership with filmmakers from the beginning of the artistic process to create a project that amplifies both art forms or was this simply a pathway to capture a time of quarantine? Who wants to answer that? Michael. I mean, I'll give you a little, it just immediately makes me think of someone like Jacob Jonas on the West Coast and his films dot dance. That is a clear thing. It's like from beginning, he's trying to create collaborate, collaborators, not only dancers, choreographer, filmmaker, bringing them together at the beginning to really create something unique from, from the start and not just a, hey, let's make a dance and then let's put it on film. Like really thinking about dance as a film from the beginning. And I, I think he's doing an incredible job. So big admirer. <laughs> Yeah, he really is. I actually presented some of his work during my dance evening. He's just, he's really got, he really has his finger on the pulse. He really does. And Amy, what do you say to that? Um, two of my collaborations uh, with Ballet X and Miami City Ballet from day one were with the editor, or cinematographer about how can we look at this piece of work and what are we gonna do, basically. And like Larry was saying, start off storyboarding. I've never storyboarded anything. As a choreographer, you know, it's just all in your head. And you just kind of, you're in the studio and it just kind of comes to life as it comes to life. And just storyboarding it um, with Ballet X, it was Elliot De Bruin. And um, with Miami City Ballet, it was Sasha. And I'm gonna get his name right because I always mess up his last name. Um, Izlev, Izlev, Sasha Izlev. So that, and, and they just kind of, we both kind of guided each other, but we both, Found our found our footing, and we came about it from our perspective of movement and the perspective of editing, and so it was it was a true collaboration, and I totally enjoyed it. But it was from day one. <laughs> That's awesome, great. And so let's see the next question we have from Stephanette. I hope I'm saying that right, Stephanette. Stephanette Short Smith, do you feel that digital dance has opened up new audiences and accessible or accessibility? Who wants to stab at that? I mean, I can say that for Summer Sage, it definitely has. I mean, obviously, my silver lining is that we've always at Summer Stage wanted to live stream. And because of the pandemic, in our 36 years of being a festival, we've never live streamed. And this was our first 
year. So I feel like it has absolutely opened up our festival and our artists that we book to, to new audiences around the world. And the feedback has been tremendous. And so for me, I do hope, you know, as we come back next year, that we do maintain some of that and also to pay homage to the audiences that bother to tune in and that we keep them. We have to still keep them engaged and, you know, to give them something to watch um, in season and off season. I mean, do any of you have that same feeling about that? I, I would say that I think the numbers are, are prove it all. Yes, it's definitely, definitely increased our audiences. Whether they stick around and how we maintain them is another question. And also, how do, how is that monetized, right? So, I mean, these are all the, the question marks, but I, without a doubt, it's increased. Okay, so our next audience question, I love these. Mark Eric from Mark Eric. I'm curious to hear about the value that the panelists would assign to virtual works versus live performance. Should performers receive the same for live versus virtual performance? Hmm, I'm assuming he means pay. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he means pay. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Or maybe he uh, he means uh, how we work with the dancers. So I, I've noticed that in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when I would choreograph, the dancers still performed as if the the audience was you know a uh, hundred meters away, and there were like two uh, uh, balconies. So I had to tell them to bring their eyes and their focus in because it's much more intimate. So I think that um, now when I work, even if it's a cinematographic archival recording. I do tell the dancers either they watch the cameraman as if it's someone or they avoid it. Uh, they let me watch them. So I did. I do start work differently on that aspect, which I didn't before. So I don't know if Mark Eric is asking that, but maybe he's asking about money. I mean, the, the, the question hit me as money because as a presenter, you know, obviously I'm, you know, used to having to, to budget out my season and, you know, obviously with the pandemic, we lost a lot of funding and sponsorship. And so we had to, of course, pay a little differently, but we tried to scale it, you know, to the time involved, uh, the, the length of the broadcast, if the, if the performer had to travel to get to a studio to record, or if they could just record at home. So there are many factors, Mark Eric, that go into what we were able to pay. But we obviously try to be as generous as possible, given the fact that these artists have lost so much work. And so that was very important to us to be able to pay as much as we possibly could. I will give out figures because that's just tasteless. But you know, to, to do our best to support these artists in this moment. Um, but before we get to our next question, I wanted to quickly go back to something you said, um, Amy, about shaping shaping your choreography and thinking as you're choreographing for the proscenium stage, but now also thinking about it for for film work. Um, yeah, yeah. And how uh, like how do you do that at the same at the same time? I figured it out as I went. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know how I figured it out was working with the editor at the top of the process, the, the answer to Monique's question, and thinking about how does it look through the lens, not how it looks on stage. So I kept always asking myself, how does this look on the, how does this look through the lens, the angle that I wanted it to be shot at, um, what kind of cameras do they have? Do they have a moving camera? So that, that changes the difference, how a dancer runs or how, how they look running. Is it, is it 360? I'm just thinking in, I always say putting my Steven Spielberg hat on. You know, that's the that's that's the uh, that's the mindset I had going into each of the virtual um, dances that I did, and it's uh, it got my movement a little bit different. I started I started changing the vocabulary of it because what reads on stage may be too much for the screen, and vice versa. So I had to start looking at it in that in that frame. And I also would I also said that um, would like to say that the editing process, knowing how you're gonna edit, having the editor in the room with you during the creative process, because that's who's gonna form the piece at the end of the day is the editor. So um, I had both Sasha and Elliot with me in, in the room. They would come in, in the room, in the Zoom, they would come into the Zoom, you know, once we had a, a, some material and we would discuss it, you know, after the rehearsal was done, like this section could go here and there so that it was a true collaboration so that the audience could see it through both what I wanted to say and through the, um, the camera's eye. Yeah. Michael? Mm -hmm. 
you actually you actually made me think of something that I was always resistant to when when people talk about uh, Paul Taylor's the like his number of works created because he actually assigned a value to dances that he had made and then adapted to screen in some ways and treated them as two separate pieces of work in in some ways. So there's a dance called Speaking in Tongues, but then there's Speaking in Tongues made for television or, and so, you know, I think I was always resistant and I feel like my mindset has changed around that in some ways because they really are two separate dances like when you look at it. So maybe if you're creating specific for camera that, that makes it a one thing, but when you're taking something that's been created for stage and then you're adapting, I feel like Annabelle, you said something about that early on in some ways and thinking of them almost as, as two works really. Like it's two different things completely. So go Paul Absolutely. Taylor. <laughs> he was ahead of his time. Didn't even realize it. Larry, did you want to add? I'm sorry. Does your hand go up? Oh, no, no. But I, I had a similar experience with Amy. In the beginning, I was just doing Zoom and trying to discover all the, those techniques. But uh, I had to work with uh, North Carolina School of the Arts in which I was able to collaborate with the, the filmmaker, the cameraman, and the editor at the very top of the um, process. So in the last year and a half, there's been an evolution, like a very quick evolution of not just, we started out in Zoom and then we've now become uh, filmmakers. And maybe I'm just saying that's another silver lining. <laughs> no, we love the silver linings. We need as much as we can get in the silver linings. Annabelle? Well, for me, it's a little different because I feel that the editing part is the choreographic part. And that's actually the most fun then, you know, choreographing on Zoom, there's a bit of um, frustration because you're not there. Uh, but once you get all the images and you put it together, that's the part that, yeah, reminds me the most uh, of choreography when I'm in the studio. So I edited almost all my movies. Wow. And so for, so for those of you that had to, you know, obviously choreograph at a distance on other, you know, dancers and companies, how how successful do you feel you were able to get across? I mean, what I saw, what we saw earlier was beautiful and it looked like it all translated, but how easy or difficult was it for you to, you know, get across the vibe or the feelings you were, were going for or to get those from the dancers? Did you have to pull things from the dancers? Did they, were they comfortable in the space that you were going for? I'll start with you, Amy. Um, in the clip you showed in, in Viva, um... Samantha and John, that was their first time back in the studio after the long layover. So, and I didn't realize that I had forgotten that I'm thinking that they were dancing, but they had been dancing at home. So we were in the studio, they had on their mask and they were, it was their first time back, you know, so, so they were huffing and puffing a little bit in the first week. God bless them. They were still in shape though. I don't know how they do that, but, um, but yeah, that was, it was the challenge. It was the challenge was for me. It wasn't for them. The challenge was just because I couldn't feel that energy that I normally felt and, you know, uh, finishing the sentences sometimes with the dancer, the dancer will help you finish the sentence and, and, or you'll just get inspired is the shorthand was gone. I'll say that the shorthand was gone on zoom. And so I had to figure out the way and the language to speak to them that I couldn't speak through my body being right there in the same studio. So once I kind of got a, a hold on that, it, it began to flow a lot faster for me. And for you, Annabelle, how, how was the experience for you getting the dancers to understand what you were trying to get them to do? Um, so with the project of uh, choreographing a work that is then performed on stage, I learned to vocalize more the steps because I'm, I'm still a very physical uh, um, choreographer and I knew that at some point I will get old and stiff and painful. So uh, it was a good it was a good way to, you know, to get um, acquainted to vocalize much more from my chair. And when I worked with all these students, I realized as I was as the pandemic went, that I could also use the rehearsals to uh, teach them tools to improvise with their uh, surroundings. So in the beginning, I would choreograph, but then 14 months later, I just let them, you know, improvise on the on the uh, you know foresight technologies uh, with the pillows or the walls and stuff like that. And I got much more interesting uh, material, also much more personal material, but also I taught them something you know, that they could use for their own choreography later. So those were two different uh, processes. That's fantastic. And did you find yourselves having Zoom, just talking to the dancers first? Like with you, Larry, did you, you know, did you meet with the dancers first? Did you have conversations before, you know, the actual creating? I mean, that is part of the creative process, but talking to all those 
people from across the world. So um, I, there came a point like maybe two weeks into starting on Zoom where I was like, I want to try to duplicate my creative process in the studio. Meaning I want to go through all the trial and error. I want to go through the mistakes. I want to find beauty in the mistakes. So I really tried to just like go through my creative process and 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 play with these people and and to create a a, a safe creative environment. I mean, we're everyone in the beginning was very uncomfortable, right? But um, we I just treated it as playtime and I had a blast on Zoom. I, I really enjoyed the Zoom rehearsals. But yes, I want to be back in the studio and I want to spend less time on the screen. I think we all do. In fact, I had a chance today actually to visit with Battery Dance um, and their rehearsal. And it was just great to just be in the studio. I mean, I might hope I'm not in the studio as much as you guys are now, but just, you know, to just to smell the, the smells of the studio, the Marley and the dancers, I mean, all good. But it was just wonderful to just be in that energy. And, and I just, I want it back for everybody because it is a special place. It's a sacred space. Um, so we had a great, uh, question from YouTube from the dear Charmaine Warren. Have each of you found your need to schedule time away from the screen? Michael, what about you? Mm, I'm not very good at that. I, I tend to get sucked into and obsessive about watching, but you know, I will, I will try to get up. I, luckily I live in places where I can go outside and look at people and life. And that's always a helpful thing. And now that we're getting back in the studio, that's been really helpful, even just, you know, teaching in class, but, again right now it does feel like we have to continue to be somewhat reliant on this as a tool and hard to limit <laughs> what about you amy how have you found getting away from the screen or how do you pull yourself away um yes i have to get away from the screen this year my eyes have completely changed i went to the eye doctor i have a new prescription so uh, <laughs> i have i have to get away from the screen um i have to schedule my time you know if you have an hour then an hour off i tend to do that now because it was it, was, it could be monotonous you know you're looking at emails you're looking at television when you're trying to escape you're still looking at a screen so i've i've learned how to just look out in the distance <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a discipline thing. And even for myself with summer stage, even though now we're in season, I still find myself right at six. I close that laptop. I could just go outside, go on the rooftop, whatever is necessary to, to take a breath from that, from that blue light. And Annabelle, how do you get away from the screen or what do you find yourself doing? Uh, well, because work was not through the screens, um, once the, the session would be over, uh, I would not go on social media. So I've done less social media cruising than in normal times. And I'm back into books. I've bought a lot of books and it's uh, wonderful to escape in, in books now as a free time. That's incredible. And so I, you know, this has been such an incredible conversation and we're all five of us existing in this space. And I, I just so hope that for all of you to get back in the studios, get back on stages. Um, I mean, I don't know who in this group is, is still dancing. I don't think any of us are really. <laughs> well, Larry, you still dance sometimes. Don't you, Michael? Of course, Michael, right? <laughs> I'll be dancing next month at Little Island. I'm terrified. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I know it's a whole thing. <laughs> but this has been tremendous. And I don't think there's any more questions. But any final words or thoughts you know, to the audience as we get back into the theaters, what we can tell our audience members and our dancers and who may be watching. I'll start with you, Amy. We're back. I'm in the studio. I'm, I can't believe I'm about to go to a rehearsal right now in the studio. People are getting back and they're moving and we'll be on stage again. And you could also catch us virtually too. So you have best of both worlds now. So that's one good thing that all this has happened. You could, you could do either or. Love it, either or. And for you, Michael. I guess I'm just really excited to see what's next and, and who thinks of something new. I'm really excited to watch and, and wait. There's a lot, a lot of freedom to, to dream in such a bigger way that I'm, I'm curious to see who, who kind of takes the reins and, and runs forward. I don't know yeah. if it'll be me, but it'll probably be one of you. I'll keep an eye on all of you. That's what I'll do. It'll be great. And good luck with your festival <laughs> next month, Asbury Dance Festival, if I can do a little plug for you. <laughs> oh, I'll take it. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. And I get to go back and do State of Darkness again. So that's very exciting. <laughs> Down in North Carolina live. What? Absolutely. That's awesome. And for you, Larry, any closing thoughts? I would say, you know, why we 
while we go through so much change, this constant change, and um, we don't know what's around the corner, to be gentle with yourself, kind with yourself, generous with others, and um, be healthy. Thank you for that. And Annabelle? Uh, well, what I've learned from the pandemic is that you can't uh, plan too much in advance. And so although I have a, a full season ahead of me with, you know, two full length ballet, brand new, I try not to be too happy that it's going to happen because I, I know that life can give us a curveball and that we'll have to take and make lemonade with it. Um, you know, I'll just I take it one day or one week at a time and see what's happening this season. I love that. One day at a time and be kind. Absolutely. And so this brings us to the end of our conversation tonight already. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, thank you all. My sincerest thanks to you all, the panelists, and for sharing your experiences with us and uh, all your insights with the audience tonight, this evening. Thank you to our amazing interpreter, Pam Pritzker with Lee, <laughs> our ASL interpreter. Thank you, of course, to Linda Shelton and the Joyce Theater for hosting tonight's panel and exploring new ways to bring us all closer to dance. A very special thank you to First Republic for presenting the Dancing Dialogue series. And finally, thank you to everyone who joined us for tonight's discussion, for all your questions, everyone who engaged in the chat. And without you, the Joyce would not be able to produce programs such as this one. If you enjoyed tonight's Dancing Dialogues, please consider supporting the Joyce, either via the QR code that you see on the screen or through the link included in the description. If you're joining via YouTube, you can also make a gift directly on the Joyce's YouTube page. So a wonderful conversation. Keep dancing. <laughs> and thank you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. See you all in person soon. Take care.